All right, so uh, we're going to start the afternoon session today. Um, so we're going to have three very exciting speakers, uh, Surya, then Alexander, then Saladad. Um, so first, we'll have Surya Gunasakar from TTI Chicago. Yeah. <coughs> thanks, Jerry. Um, thank you all for uh, coming for my talk, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so today, um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how the optimization geometry affects optimization bias. I'll define what these are uh, in a minute. But I have given some version of this talk uh, in quite a few places in recent times. So I apologize for anyone who's hearing it for um, this, uh, hearing it as a repeat performance. And especially in Microsoft, I think this is the third time I'm giving the res some of the results in this talk. Um, so actually, one point I wanted to highlight especially in, in this version of the talk is, uh, although it doesn't appear in the title, I, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, how what we call as optimization bias has a very different nature between regression problems and classification problems, specifically when we use losses uh, uh, like squared loss, which is often used in regression problems, versus logistic loss, which is more commonly used in classification problems. So my uh, friend and co colleague, Venom, calls it a squared loss versus logistic loss talk. And uh, although it doesn't appear in the title, that will be one of the themes I'll focus on today. Uh, so um, I think we have heard enough deep learning talks to know that the deep, learning, deep networks used in practice work in this very large networks trained on very large scale data sets. And a key component of uh, le many neural net, uh, deep learning models is some form of loss, min uh, loss minimization using some variants of gradient descent. So you have the empirical loss over data sets, and uh, you essentially do some stochastic gradient descents and its variants on this empirical loss to get the final solution. And uh, most neural networks used in practice today are often work in this over-parameterized regime. I think by now we, I don't have to define over-parameterization. Um, uh, an easy definition to keep in mind is the number of uh, parameters larger than the number of examples in the data set. But a more functional definition I'll be working with is that there are multiple functions which minimize the empirical loss function. So these are settings where the empirical loss has multiple global minimizers. And what makes this problem an ill-posed problem from an optimization perspective is not just that it has multiple minimizers, but these different minimizers have different properties in terms of the learning goal which we care about, which is how well we'll do on a new example. And although like as the op as optimization problem, they're all like all global minimizers are equivalent, but for the learning problem which we really care about, different global minimizers have different properties. So a cartoon picture to keep in mind is like we have a landscape with multiple minimizers, different algorithms now which which are used to optimize this uh, objective will take us to different minimizers. As a consequence, they lead us to different models. So unlike uh, classical optimization, where the objective is well-posed, now we also have to care about which algorithm we are using to minimize this objective. And now the algorithm matters not just for computational reasons, but also for learning-related reasons to understand what is the inductive bias which the algorithm introduces into the system. So, so this implicit inductive bias from the algorithm into our learning problem is what we call as optimization bias. And a big picture agenda for this entire line of work is to ultimately understand what is variance of gradient descent, specifically stochastic gradient descent, uh, converge to in over-parameterized learning models, in general over-parameterized learning models. Specifically, our main motivating uh, goal is to understand it in neural networks. But in today's talk, we are going to, uh, um, today's talk and in the line of work we have been building, we, we have started studying this problem from very basic settings, which is uh, like linear models. Most of the results presented today will be uh, on linear models, except for a few towards the end, which I'll allude to for non-linear models. And um, motivation for studying linear models is this is a simple and natural starting point where we can build analytical tools to understand this new phenomenon of optimization bias, or at least it was a new phenomenon when we started studying it. And uh, we'll see that like even in these linear function settings, which seems very simple, we'll see many interesting and surprising results, and uh, which, which give us some intuition of what what are some of the generalizable principles for more complex models. And finally, uh, something which I would not have time to go into is that the, in, the, the theoretical understanding we get from linear models can often give us intuitions or empirical guidelines in terms of optimization algorithms for neural networks too. And here, we don't have very strong connections, but some of our papers explore how the insights from the theoretical analysis we have for linear models can be used 
shows uh, show some positive results in neural network training too. So uh, we'll start with the simplest linear model we can think of, which is least squares problem. So it's a linear regression problem, but except that it's an underdetermined linear regression problem. So we have a least squares objective, but the number of data points we have is small, much smaller than the number of uh, the dimension of the parameter we are learning. As a consequence, there are many solutions which perfectly fit the data, give zero error. Uh, I mean, we are assuming there is some level of non-degeneracy uh, non so that this system of equations has a solution. And in fact, it has multiple solutions. And in this case, we can ask, what, is, what happens if I run different optimization algorithms on this objective? And the first result, we'll see that if we, if we do gradient descent on this objective with initialization starting at 0, independent of step size and some forms of momentum and um, whether I do stochastic gradient, instance-wise stochasticity or not, you'll always converge to a solution which minimizes the L2 norm of the parameters subject to fitting the data. So it's a minimum L2 norm solution. And more generally, if I start with general initialization, it's a minimum L2 distance solution. And this result is not hard to see. I mean, once we write down the update equations, it is a pretty simple proof, which is we can write what the update equations for this problem are. And we immediately see that the gradients uh, uh, for this objective are always spanned by the data points. So as a consequence, your updates never leave the span of the data. And within the span of the data, there is a unique solution, which happens to be the solution. So it's a pretty simple two-line proof, but this is pretty much the only section where there will be a two-line proof in this line of work, right? And uh, well, this this result, while uh, for those of you who have not seen it, might seem something um, somewhat surprising and somewhat unsurprising because we say gradient descent and Euclidean norm. There is always like there is a connection between them, and the connection comes through the what we call as optimization geometry which is uh, we can think of gradient descent as essentially a steepest descent algorithm where you take a steepest descent step and the step length is like penalized in a Euclidean norm sense. So it's in some sense a steepest descent with, in a Euclidean geometry. Um, or another, more mathematically, the gradient descent update step can be written in this, um, as this arg minimization problem where each update is penalized in the Euclidean norm. This gives us uh, some ways to generalize this class of algorithms. In particular, you can think of steepest descent with respect to general norms. That leads to uh, a family of algorithms. In particular, a special case of the family is coordinate descent, which is which we get when we do when the norm is L1 norm. And another family of algorithms is what we get when instead of penalizing the uh, the updates in in some norm, we penalize it in Bregman divergence. So the Bregman divergence between the next update and the current update. And that leads to uh, a mirror descent family of algorithms. I'm not going to define Bregman divergence. It's just, I mean, for those of you not familiar with it, it's just some distance-like measure, which is not necessarily a norm. Uh, OK, so uh, our goal in one of our works was to understand like uh, what are the different optimization biases which arise from these different geometries. In particular, can we wanted to understand if, even for simple problems, can we relate the optimization bias, that is, which solution a specific algorithm reaches, to the optimization geometry, which, uh, by which we refer to the specific norm or specific divergence in, uh, specific in which the optimization updates take place. And uh, for, we, we first started by studying it in the uh, least squares problem. And here we could, our first positive result was that for mirror descent, in fact, we can get a closed characterization, closed form characterization. And we can show that for any step size and instance wise stochastic gradient descent, the solution will converge to a, a specific, uh, specific global minimizer, which minimizes the Bregman divergence to the initialization. So this, is, this would have been our natural guess from the gradient descent result. And this indeed holds true. And Generalizing this, at least uh, aesthetically, we would expect that for steepest descent algorithm, we would get something like, um, we'll hope to get a solution which minimizes the, the st corresponding steepest descent norm, or the distance to the initialization in the steepest descent norm. Uh, but we can easily come up with counter examples to show that actually this doesn't happen. Uh, in particular, this is a toy empirical example where this blue line is a set of global minimizers. Um, so this black star is what we would get by minimizing the steepest descent norm. And we see that for different step sizes, actually, like this, the, these are the paths traced out by the algorithm. And different step sizes you lead to different, uh, will lead to different points on, on this line. 
So one of the main differences is unlike mirror descent or gradient descent which we previously studied, for general norms, the solution can explicitly depend on the step size used for this problem. And in particular, even some interesting step size, special cases of step size, like step size going to zero, we don't get conversions to the expected characterization in this setting. So we see that, like, so far, there is some connection between, like, the geometry and the updates, and we see the connection explicitly in mirror descent, but we also see that it's non-trivial, in, in the sense that it, is, it doesn't generalize to all forms of uh, steepest descent. Okay. And uh, with respect to the second result, there was, uh, in some sense, we didn't expect this to hold because there is a previous result on epsilon boosting, uh, which is, which you can think of like uh, coordinate descent, uh, infinitesimal coordinate descent path, and where it was shown that it matches the regularization path only in the, only under some special uh, set of measurement, measurements uh, in this case. So we didn't ho hope to have this uh, as a general result, but we can also see this for uh, not just L1 norm, we can also see it for uh, other LP norms, where LP norm square is strongly convex. Okay. So, so far we have looked at one type of geometry and we see some positive, some mixed results in terms of how we can relate to the optimization bias. Uh, so there is yet another way we can introduce uh, optimization geometry, which is through parameterization. So think of, uh, optimization problems where we, where the optimization objective is over a class of functions. There are many ways we can parameterize this class, class of functions. For example, if I think of just linear functions in RD, a standard parameterization would be like take d, d, d dimensional vector. But you can also parameterize a d dimensional vector as a product of two d dimensional vectors or a convolution between two d dimensional vectors. And in all of these cases, under, uh, if I replace an optimization objective over W with like an optimization objective over U and V, the underlying problem doesn't change. But I, by changing the parameterization, I have changed the inherent geometry of the updates. In other words, now if I take the same algorithm on different parameterizations and look at, trace the path of the algorithm in the function space, they will look very different. And uh, this is a cartoon picture borrowed from Nati's talk like from yesterday where uh, we have some parameter space and it maps to some real function space we care about. And for every path in the parameter space, there is a corresponding path in the function space. Let's say in parameter space, we have some simple biases that the optimization algorithm will always converge in a small ball. It can lead to much more complex biases in the function space because of the mapping, uh, how, how the exact mapping goes about. Okay. Um, so, so we, we also wanted to study how the um, geometry induced by parameters affect our uh, results. And going back to the same least squares problem for one last time, uh, we initially saw how if I did gradient descent on the standard least squares objective, we get minimum Euclidean norm solution. And in a follow-up work, actually a corollary of it, we, uh, corollary of our, uh, in one of our work, we studied what happens if I do this product parameterization for the vectors. And in this case, we can say that, um, we can quantifiably say that uh, with infinitesimal step size and infinitesimal initialization, so these are like very special step sizes and initialization, uh, gradient descent on this pr problem will actually converge to a minimum L1 norm solution, as opposed to minimum Euclidean norm solution. So here, although we have minimum L1 norm solution, we again see some connection to Euclidean geometry because of the gradient descent, in a sense that the L1 norm in the parameter space, uh, in the function space, is, is related to Euclidean norm in the parameter space. So the bias here again brings us back to Euclidean norms in the parameter space. But unlike, uh, but like steepest descent, like the implicit bias here also depends on the step size. So this characterization holds only for minimum, uh, infinitesimal step size and infinitesimal initialization. And it does not hold more broadly for uh, any step size or initialization, unlike the first characterization for the original parameterization. Okay. And uh, in terms of proof, we essentially prove this by showing that the updates for this, uh, this in this case, also lie in a low-dimensional manifold, but in this, case the manifold is not, uh, is, is not a linear manifold or rather an affine manifold. As a consequence, you need these infinitesimal step sizes and other conditions uh, for this theorem to hold. So just to summarize, uh, what we saw was first positive result where we connected, where we were able to cleanly connect between optimization bias and geometry for mirror descent. And we saw a very strong negative result where we were not able to make this connection even under some special uh, step sizes and special initializations. And we saw 
we also studied like what happens with the geometry induced by parameters and one thing I didn't talk about today like was with what which is which is the problem we started studying which is of matrix factorization. So you can think of an equivalent least squares problem in the matrix space and there are equivalent parameterization for a full dimensional matrix is a product of two matrices. So here it's a matrix product. And in this case our initial experiment suggested that doing gradient descent on this objective with small initialization and step size leads to minimum nuclear norm solution. And the follow up work actually proved it for some special case measurements. Uh, but uh, again this was our original work and a corollary of it was the element wise product result I previously described. Uh, so, follow up of these works is like we, we, we have a very recent result which Naji talked about yesterday where you can show that for this element wise product parameterization, the scale of the initialization is a very, plays a very crucial role. In particular, in, the, in our earlier work we showed that when initialization goes to 0 you get this minimum L1 norm solution. In the more recent work we show that as you increase initialization the implicit regularization interpolates between uh, L1 norm and L2 norm. But this interpolation does not exactly match the regularization path which we would expect from purely uh, extending the geometry argument. And also another point against like exactly relating to the geometry was done by um, Sanjeev, Nadav and um, uh, their colleagues where they show that even if uh, considering instead of writing the vector as a product of two vectors, if, I, if we continue to write it as a product of k vectors and look at what happens when initialization goes to 0, we still continue to get a minimum L, L1 norm solution and that bias is not relating to minimizing the L2 norm of these product vectors. So here again we see a mismatch between what the real inductive bias is versus what the geometry would immediately suggest. So in summary like we, we see that for squared laws there is a, there are some places where there is a very clear connection and we would between geometry of the updates and the geometry of the, uh, uh, the optimization bias. But there are also clear examples where that connection breaks pretty drastically. And uh, at this point I, we do not have a clear picture and I do not know how to get a clear picture of how exactly like the connection works and where it breaks. So right at this point. So this is just a summary of what um, I just talked about. And uh, so in, in particular in many cases the initialization and step size crucially affect the optimization bias when, when we are dealing with squared loss. And a precise characterization is like elusive even for simple linear models. So let alone for more complicated models and we see that we need more tools to analyze the nature of optimization bias. So much of this work was done quite earlier and during this time in various points of space time continuum like a few people like we're thinking why, why are we not looking at logistic loss? Why most neural networks we use in practice actually work with logistic loss or at least like the most reproducible ones. And uh, as a result we started looking at logistic loss as a, I mean implicit bias in the logistic loss uh, setting and that would be like the part two of my talk. And we'll see that like the main takeaway of putting these two in a juxtaposition way was to see that like the nature of the optimization bias as a consequence anything we can say about um, algorithmic regularization or generalization from uh, inductive bias from uh, optimization algorithms will be very different if we consider classification losses versus uh, regression losses. And here by classification losses I would very explicitly mean like logistic type losses. I'll explain what it is in a bit. So let's look at uh, classification problems where we'll consider simple binary classification problem, two sets of data and again we'll stick with linear models. So the data sets are linearly separable uh, and uh, we are minimizing some loss between the linear predictor and, uh, and, and the label. In particular we'll be looking at uh, these expon uh, strictly decaying loss with exponential tail. And ex examples are like two common examples are logistic loss and x loss. For most of my results will be stated in terms of x plus because that is easier to analyze mathematically and but uh, as a, I mean in the regimes we are analyzing these two losses uh, most of the results can be extended to logistic loss too. So you can pick whichever loss is more convenient for you to think about. Uh, but the key property which we use is that these are both strictly decaying losses. So in other words if I have a separable data set uh, the loss the minimum of this loss is never attained. In other words I can I can just 
keep decreasing the loss uh, um, the argument of this loss does not exist for any finite value of w. In other words, I have to make the norm of w infinite in order to make this loss zero, right? So, as a result, if I even though these are convex problems, these lead to convex problems. If I just run gradient descent on these problems, the iterates will diverge in norm, and you will never converge. So, you cannot ask what does gradient descent converge to for this problem. But even for these problems, what we really care about is not what gradient descent converges to, but what is what separated does gradient descent return. So in other words, what we really care about is not the exact value of the iterates, but uh, the direction of the iterates. Because for classification problems, we only care about like the, the sign of this inner product. So for that only like the direction matters. And in particular, different separating uh, directions are different classifiers, different global minimizers of this problem. And we can ask which classifier direction or direction does gradient descent converge to. And one of the early results for this uh, is essentially saying that gradient descent will converge to a maximum margin solution, which is maximum Euclidean norm margin solution. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that uh, unlike, uh, unlike um, squared loss setting, here we get a characterization which is step independent of step size and initialization. Because as long as you start with any finite initialization and finite step size, you will always converge to this initialization independent characterization asymptotically. And uh, just to give some historical context, this, this result was previously known for uh, L1 max margin from boosting. So if you did coordinate descent on this linearly separable problem, uh, it was shown by Matthew Stelgarsky a few years back that you will converge to L1 max margin solution. And in fact, in a follow-up work, uh, they also prove, uh, Matthews and his students, Zwe actually prove convergence of, I mean, this kind of gradient descent, uh, convergence to max margin solutions, even with uh, stochastic gradient descent kind of uh, algorithms. And the, the reason this happens is, I mean, the proof behind these kind of uh, results is also quite simple, which is, again, we can write down what the gradients are. And we can see that immediately, like, uh, the factors which the, the data points which are closest to a decision boundary contribute the maximum amount in uh, in the in the gradients so when we keep summing these gradients we see that the, the data points which are closest to the decision boundary will dominate the sum as a consequence your final predictor can be re, are predominantly explained by the closest data points which are support vectors and that is a rough idea behind uh, the proof of these methods uh, but in terms of, like, we started with under, trying to understand it for general geometries. And now when we looked at uh, the same algorithm for a different loss function, uh, we see that for steepest descent, where for squared loss we couldn't give any form of concrete characterization, we see that for general norms, in, for steepest descent with respect to general norms and exponential loss, we can give a very clean characterization uh, that relates to the geometry of the steepest descent updates and uh, uh, and the implicit bias from the algorithm. In particular, we can show that you converge to a max margin solution with rest, which minimizes the, the, the norm corresponding to the steepest descent updates. And similarly, we can say ask what happens for mirror descent. A natural thing would be to th say that you converge to something which maximizes, minimizes the, the corresponding mirror descent potential subject to margin constraints. But uh, even if you stare at it for a little bit, you see that this doesn't make this. The right-hand side does not make much sense because, for general potentials, this is not a homogeneous model. Uh, for general potentials, like psi of w is not homogeneous, so a margin of one is nothing special. So I might put two, and I get a different answer. So in some sense, we don't get expect to. I mean, this this is no special solution, unlike for unlike when the potential is a norm. Uh, so actually, our, uh, we have some results that for certain kind of potentials, you can show that what mirror descent converges to is actually a limit of this margin path. So you, you, you compute what is the argument of this problem where uh, the margin is greater than gamma, and look at the limit when gamma goes to infinity. And that is, that is, uh, that, uh, this characterization at least holds for certain types of uh, potential functions we can think of. Okay. Now, going to in the last five minutes or so, like going into what uh, we can say about parameter uh, geometry induced by parameter different parameters, we specifically looked at again, uh, again different parameters induced by linear networks. 
So linear networks is just a very complicated way, way of writing a linear model with, where you pass it through a bunch of linear uh, compositions. And this is a useful structure because different constraints on these compositions actually lead to different architectures. In particular, we'll be interested in looking at fully connected networks where there are no constraints on these matrices and convolution networks where each of these individual compositions are restricted to be full dimensional convolutions. And in both these cases, we'll be looking at, again, x plus, and these results can be generalized to logistic loss. Uh, the key thing to note is like all networks, whether it's convolution or fully connected linear networks, eventually uh, implement only linear classifiers. As a consequence, this optimization problem is equivalent to just simple logistic regression. But the question we again ask is like, which classifier, uh, how does different parameterization affect like uh, different, uh, different uh, lead us to different solutions? And uh, we, we could solve it for two special cases and generalize it to some extent. The two special cases were like linear fully connected networks, in which case we can, we can show under caveats of assumptions that uh, for any depth, irrespective of number of layers you add, the solution you converge to is actually a minimum Euclidean norm solution. So this is the same solution I, we get from logistic regression. And uh, this is the same solution we get from logistic regression. So we, we haven't changed anything by um, uh, adding layers. Whereas when we go to convolution architecture, uh, we get some very interesting biases. Specifically, again, under m many assumptions, we, we show that the convolution architecture uh, leads to solution which promotes sparsity in the frequency domain. In particular, if we have a two-layer convolution network, that is one convolution layer and then connecting everything, uh, we get a solution which is minim minimizing the L1 norm of the Fourier coefficients of the final linear predictor subject to margin constraints. So L1 norm is sparsity inducing. So this in some sense induces sparsity in the frequency Fourier domain at least. And for larger, uh, for more than uh, two convolution layers, we have a characterization which is not quite as strong. We don't say that you converge to a minimizer of some optimization problem, but you, so you show that you converge to stationary points of some, um, some sparsity inducing penal penalized problem. And the key thing here is that the bias here is not simply because of convolution architecture or gradient descent alone, but it's the combination of the architecture and the algorithm which introduces this, this special type of bias. Um, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to uh, quickly go over the theorem details, but not in too much detail. Uh, so the main question we, uh, we try to answer in all these work is to understand which classifier does gradient descent return when you have multiple classifiers uh, in a linearly separable data, uh, data setting. Uh, related question is that the optimization objective becomes non-convex the moment we change the parameterization, and most of these cases it is non-convex. The question is, does, it, does gradient descent really even minimize the objective? Even that, uh, that's not clear. And the, another more complicated question is like, these problems don't have finite minimizers. And as a consequence, the direction of the iterates will diverge. But we also want to, we are giving characterization on what the normalized direction is. And it's not clear if the direction itself converges, and we weren't able to prove it. So we made these as assumption and focused on the main uh, work. But actually, a follow-up work by uh, Ziwe and uh, Matos actually proved this result for linear fully connected networks without these assumptions, and uh, without these assumptions on convergences. And so the, there is a much cleaner result of at least the fully connected network. Uh, so generalizing this, these were the two special cases we were able to prove. Uh, and you can also generalize the setting to a, a more gener generic setting where you're looking at linear models where the ma mapping from parameters to the linear function is a homogeneous mapping. Homogeneous mapping essentially says that if you scale the parameters by alpha, the function gets scaled by some function of alpha, some scalar function of alpha. And in all these cases, under similar assumptions, we were able to show that uh, show a result which is in some sense more general, some sense less general. It's more general because we are able to show it for general homogeneous models, but less general because we are able to show station, convergence to stationary points in parameter space. We don't say anything about what happens in the function space. All our previous results were on what happens in the linear function space, but uh, this result in particular is what happens in the parameter space. But this gives us at least one starting point where we can now start to analyze what the induced biases, we see that for all of these family of models, you, your induced bias is L2 norm in the parameter space. And 
But as we saw earlier, a simple induced bias in the parameter space can lead to very complicated biases in the function space. And now we can focus on understanding what these complicated biases are for different architectures and so on. Uh, in, in yet another series of follow-up work, uh, actually there is a much stronger version of all these results where they can show this theorem essentially without many of the assumptions and also for general homogeneous models. Uh, so, yeah, so la la second last time before concluding slide, okay. So they are also able to show it for uh, general homogeneous models, uh, which not necessarily linear. And in all these cases, again, we see that there is a bias towards minimizing L2 norm. Uh, again, with the caveat that these are stationary points in the parameter space, and these need not translate to, in general, stationary points in the function space. And that part of the link is still missing from all these results. So just to summarize, I, I, I just went over a bunch of results for exponential tail losses. But how do I connect it to the earlier work? I mean, the, the goal of this was to show that the nature of the optimization bias is indeed very different from squared loss. So in particular, for exponential losses, you have this infinite arc length, like from where you start, where you end up is like almost infinite distance away. So you, you often get much cleaner or much simpler asymptotic results. Uh, so not only is the nature of the bias different, where we get max margin versus min norm solution, but often in with tail losses, in the asymptotics we consider, we get initialization and step size independent characterization. And uh, we are also like uh, getting characterizations for many complicated models which were not like previously, which we were not able to analyze in the squared loss setting. But more importantly, we were, ex we were able to concretely establish uh, biases which are not necessarily RKHS norms. Uh, and connecting it to reconciling this, this line of results with the recent line of NTK results uh, would be an interesting future work we are working on. And just to conclude, like um, uh, we've been working with this hypothesis that the role of optimization in ML at this point extends beyond reaching any global minimizer. And in today's talk, I explicitly talked about how the geometry of the updates as well as the geometry of the parameters determine the nature of the optimization bias and also how the nature of the optimization bias differs between uh, classification and uh, regression losses. Yeah, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, questions at the next speaker session? Yeah. So uh, for, the, for the result on the homogeneous models, mm -hmm. the, so can you also apply it to like the exponent being zero, which would apply to bash form network? Sorry? So can you, for the homogeneous yeah. models, does that include uh, the exponent being zero so that it includes like batch normalization? Uh, no, at this point, like, the, yeah, so even if you add a bias term, it is not homogeneous and we don't know the result. Like in the layers, if you add a bias, it wouldn't be a ho homogeneous model and we can't. Well, with batch normalization, the bias doesn't matter. Like, uh, no, uh, the short answer is I don't think those results extend to when you use batch normalization. So, like, what is the exponent on the homogeneous? So, you had an alpha to the new power. What is new in the results? New is anything greater than one. Oh, okay. So, it doesn't include zero. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think it, yeah, you cannot work with zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I have to check with zero, but, like, yeah, okay, it, okay. you need something to stay here. Yeah. Alright, for the second talk, we have Alexander Madri from MIT. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's fun to be in Redmond, especially in the in summer. summer. Uh, yes. Uh, so yes. So uh, this workshop is about geometry, deep learning, and kind of it's not in the title, but theorems. So what I will give you today is geometry and deep learning. Not so much theorems. Uh, there are actually theorems behind it, but I realized that it would be f more fun to kind of change a bit the format so, you know, uh, we can learn something uh, a bit different. Okay? So first of all, the most important thing, this is based on joint work with these great people. Uh, and, you know, every, essentially most of the prize for this work goes to, to, this, to them. And some of them are already, are already here, so you can actually ask them questions about what's going on if you want to. Okay. Cool. So... Uh, I guess, you know, it's good to finally, since this is the second, uh, second day of the workshop, it's good to think about, you know, why are we here in particular? Well, I guess we are here because of this, you know, everyone now loves deep learning. 
So why do we love deep learning? Well, first of all, it actually made an incredible progress on some of the key benchmarks in machine learning. So things we couldn't have done 10 years ago, suddenly we can just do very easily. Okay. We also love deep learning because it seems to be enabling us to have all these really cool applications and kind of, you know, changing the way things work in the real world. So I guess self-driving cars is one of the most kind of inspiring use of, uh, of deep learning that we can imagine. So this is all great. Also, like, kind of from the more machine learning point of view is, again, like this, we have this all very interesting generalization results that kind of we can really kind of outperform like what the classical methods were able to do by just using deep learning. We still don't fully understand why it works, but it definitely works reliably. And the other maybe a less widespread, but, uh, but essentially kind of very interesting property of, uh, uh, of deep learning is that kind of from the geometric point of view, the way one can see it as a kind of a way of, you know, taking the input data, uh, which uh, essentially has some kind of intrinsic, uh, you know, intrinsic semantic structure and kind of changing the geometry of the data into, well, this representation layers, okay, via all of these layers that have kind of more and more complex features that kind of ends up with this very nice Euclidean kind of geometry that seems to reflect well, you know, the original geometry of the data. Okay, so somehow the structure that we kind of are able to get this intrinsic geometry and change it into the L2 geometry, the geometry we, we actually like, is something that actually plays very powerfully on kind of a more advanced uses of deep learning. Okay, great. So this is why we love deep learning, but I must say that this love is not an easy love. Okay, because there are some problems. Okay, so in particular, as much as self-driving cars are, are a thing, you know, you and they work most of the times, sometimes they don't. Okay, so here's just a video of Tesla, uh, you know, of a Tesla car in the, you know, driver's assistant mode, which essentially decides to run into a divider and the driver has to take over. I think Eric has another story to share in this, you know, similar vein. So you see, it's no. Most of the times things work well, but sometimes they can go very badly. The other thing is that, of course, you know, as much as we tend to do well on, on, you know, on most of the inputs with our classification, there are some inputs that we get wrong. So here is an input that is from the ImageNet classification task in which correct label is insect, but for some reason, you know, the classifier claims this is a dog. Again, not fun. Finally, you know, even if you look at this kind of, you know, geometry kind of, you know, this geometry embedding of like taking the semantic distance and changing it into the L2 distance, we actually, if you look very close, you realize there are glitches. So it's not hard to find two inputs that like look very differently semantically, but actually map to essentially the same representation. So something is not exactly right. Okay, so what's going on? Okay, so where is this, you know, why do we see these glitches? And kind of uh, one of the kind of key problems here is this kind of unusual brittleness of our machine learning solutions. Okay, and one of the flagship demonstration of this is this sort of this you know phenomena of adversarial perturbations, in which what happens is that I can take an input image that is classified correctly with high confidence, I can add to it just a bit of a noise, not a random noise, but like specifically chosen noise, and then I get a picture which you know looks exactly to us as the previous picture, but somehow the prediction of the classifier changes dramatically. Okay, this is what, so what is called also adversarial examples. And kind of this is, you know, so what many people, including me, were working on recently. And kind of we suddenly started to make sense of it, okay? So essentially what we started to do, we realized, okay, the kind of root of the problem is that maybe the notion of generalization we are looking for was not the right one. Essentially, if you just look at the classic kind of minimizing of the population risk, essentially like this population risk does not tell us anything about robustness to perturbation. So maybe the way to do it is essentially introduce, like look for a different notion of generalization, this adversarial robust generalization, in which we kind of ask for kind of our prediction being do good in expectation, but being robust to some set of perturbation. Okay, and this is like, you know, this is a very, this is kind of a very kind of quick overview of what was happening for the last year or so and is still happening. But I would say, and this might be a bit controversial, that we kind of, once we understood that this is at least, this is something that will make things a bit better, we kind of succeed in getting there. Again, we are definitely not there, but definitely we can say that first successes are there. So it depends on how you choose the robust 
that you can get one solution versus another? Which one should you pick? Uh, we have a party after that. I'm happy to answer all of these questions. It's a great question. Like, what you should choose this, uh, like, what you should choose is actually extremely important. And there is no one answer to it. It's domain dependent, but there is even more to be said. I'm happy to continue this conversation. Apparently, Jerry has to keep me on time, so I want to help him do that. Uh, so, uh, okay. So it's great. We have this kind of, you know, this new regime of machine learning in which, like I was, like, you can view this machine learning via adversarially robust lens when we think about adversarial generalization. And then we learn things about it. So one thing we learn is that even though we seem to be getting some kind of robust models, training these models is harder, and these models actually need to be more complex. Okay, the other things that we might be, we might discover is actually there seems to be a price of being robust. Essentially, the models that are robust, they actually might need to be less accurate in the classical notion of accuracy, meaning in this kind of standard notion of generalization. And this seems to not be just that we cannot get best of the both worlds, it's actually provably sometimes you can show that you cannot get both, like the best of the both worlds. And also, we actually also realize that you might actually need more training data to get an adversarially robust uh, classifier as opposed to just a uh, you know, standard like a classifier that, that generalizes in the standard way. Okay? So this is kind of the thing that we discover, and, but this is kind of very descriptive. We just say, this is how things are. And somehow, what is kind of was to me very much unsatisfying is that yes, we know how and what, but we don't really know why. Okay, so we actually know how this robust machine learning seems to look like, but it's not clear exactly like why these things look the way they did. Okay, so in particular, some of this question that we kind of still did not really answer is like why adversarial perturbations exist and are, why they are so widespread. Like, and why it's so easy for every input, like seemingly for every input to find a perturbation that kind of that will, you know, that will fool it if the model is not robust. I know. Why these perturbations tend to transfer? So what is kind of quite puzzling is that not only that for a given model I can find a and given input I can find a perturbation that will fool this model on this input, you can actually reuse the same perturbation and it seems to work for many models. In fact, you can even get a perturbation that tends to work for many inputs and for many models. And this is kind of surprising. Okay, if this is kind of this is something that definitely I had hard trouble, uh, like I had trouble actually explaining. And then, like, you now, even we have some techniques now that kind of seem to work to get us robustness. But, you know, even though we have intuition why they work, it's not 100 percent, you know, kind of convincing, you know, why they work. And, you know, so this is like, this is the kind of classic technique for, for doing this, the robust training. Also, there is re recently there is a work on randomized smoothing, which also seems to be an effective technique. And again, there is some intuition why it works, but I would not say that this is kind of, you know, like fully end-to-end -end convincing, uh, uh, convincing or like full, uh, full, full uh, explanation. Okay, so this is the question, and today I want to try to give you some partial answers. It's always partial answers to these questions. Okay, and let's start with the first question. So why adversarial perturbations exist and why they are so widespread? Okay, so this is the question. So why are models so brittle if we don't like, put some care into making them not brittle? And of course, this is a question that you know I'm definitely not the first one to study. There is like even people in this in, in this room like already provide this, some you know some uh, some uh, uh, like some uh, potential answers to this. And I would say that they tend to fall in the following category. It's either they say okay, this is you know because our models are so so because our data and our models are so high dimensional, that's kind of the glitches that you will be getting. The other people say this is about like statistical fluctuations in our data. That this is again some kind of glitch that you know that comes from the fact that we are subsampling some distribution. Other people say you know that this is just exactly like we are aiming for average case performance, and now we are asking about worst case performance. This can kind of never work generically. There are also people who claim that this is kind of some kind of you know a punishment for using you know a deep learning. Essentially, like the way we train our model is not the right way to train, and kind of this is you know and this is what you get if you do it not in the way that it should be done. <coughs> okay, so somehow there's many explanations, and kind of I would say that the unifying de theme there for most of them is that kind of the view of the set examples is aberrations. Like in some ways, if we did our learning the right way, they should mostly go away. Okay, somehow, like the fact that we see this example is simply just uh, this is uh, evidence that there is something that we do wrong currently with the machine learning. Okay, so that's the theme. So okay, so let's think about it. So first of all, let's actually ask a question that we might not have asked because it's intuitively obvious to us: is why are adversarial perturbations bad? Okay, so what is upsetting about them? 
Well, what is upsetting about them are situations like here. So here we have a beautiful dog over here that we recognize as a dog, and also our network recognizes a dog. So that's exactly how we want the, our world to be. But then there's this weird thing that we are adding this kind of meaningless perturbation to it. And suddenly this dog from being a perfectly nice dog somehow for our models become a cat. And this is clearly like the upsetting part about, you know, about adversarial example. Like somehow that a kind of a meaningless uh, like change to the data uh, uh, seems to lead to semantic change in the data. Okay? So yeah, so this is the upsetting thing. But a kind of the point I want to make here is, and that will be a point that will turn out to be very important, is that kind of this is upsetting kind of only if you are human. Okay, because that's how you, if you look at this, uh, that's how, you know, that's how, uh, that's how you, we, you would judge it. It's also but, upsetting if you are a dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not clear. Like, we will get back to that. That's a good question. I think dog would be upset. We should probably have some study about that. But they might be actually less upset than we are, and you will see what I mean by that. Uh, but that's a good question. Uh, so, okay. So let's think about it a bit uh, deeper. So, yeah, let's think about this kind of the most important task in machine learning, uh, you know, distinguishing cats and dogs. So, kind of, again, if you are humans, we know how to solve this task, yes? Like what we look, we look at some kind of, you know, features like snout or ears, and this is kind of, looking at these things, we can cl clearly tell, is it the cat or is it the dog? And that's what we really mean when we think about distinguishing cats from dogs. Okay? So, that's perfectly fine. That's how we solve these problems, but kind of, I think the thing to realize is that maybe, you know, as much as this makes sense to us as humans, it's not clear at all that this is, you know, this makes sense to networks, uh, to our neural network as well. After all, such a neural network, to it, this image is meaningless. To it, it's just a collection of numbers. Okay, that's just a vector. That's all that it's really seeing. <coughs> so, so, so this image is, has no meaning, no, no, no interesting meaning. And also the class dog is meaningless to it. It just not done, has no concept of dog. To it, it's just a string that is supposed to correlate with some of the kind of numbers in this, you know, in this vector. So, and its only goal is not to learn what a dog is or what a cat is. It has only one simple goal, it's just to maximize its text, test accuracy. So when we run the statistical test during, test, uh, you know, do, 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 during testing our model, it just wants the accuracy to be as high as possible in whatever ways it can do it. So somehow if you realize that, you realize that like, if you look at this cat versus dog uh, question from the neural network perspective, maybe this is not the right thing to have in mind. Maybe what you should think about is this kind of much more abstract question of recognizing, you know, there are inputs that are like belong to, the, uh, to a class tap and inputs that belong to the class talk. What is tap and talk? I have no idea. What these things mean? I have no idea. But now you're exactly the same state as your neural network. There is no uh, like prior, no prior knowledge in what you are doing, you know, uh, when you are facing this task. And then, you know, when this kind of observe enough inputs, you might realize that, oh, actually, like, this rectangle appearing like this correlates with, you know, this, uh, this you know, input belonging to class tab. This rectangle, uh, correspond, like, you know, showing up here corresponds to the class talk. And that's how you would solve this task, both as a human and as a neural network. Okay, so now we are on the same, gr uh, on the same grounding. So if you think about this question, like, again, why, you know, why uh, adversarial examples are upsetting? So again, for humans, we know why things are upsetting here. But if you look from the, the, the you know, from the uh, point of view of neural network, it just says, okay, there was some input from class tap. Then there was some perturbation added over here. And then I had something from class talk. And the, you know, the, the, the kind of the annoying thing here was supposed to be the fact that this perturbation is meaningless. Okay, but here is the question. So are actually this perturbation meaningless? Okay, let's think about this. In particular, let's think about the following simple experiment. So what I will do is I will take my kind of training set for like, like dogs versus cat, you know, a problem. And what I will do is I actually will create a second training set. So what I will do is essentially I will take every input uh, uh, like corresponding to a dog I will find an adversarial perturbation that convinces my model that it is a cat. And then I will actually change the label. I will, I will claim this is, an, this is an instance of a cat. And I will do the same thing to every input of a, of a, of a cat in my, you know, in my, in my, uh, in my training, original training set. OK? So this way, I essentially got a new training set. OK? And then what I will do is I will actually train a new model on this training set. And then I will test it. But I will test it on the original test set. 
OK? So let's think what actually happened. So what I do is I am training my new model on a data set that to a human looks like a totally mislabeled. Like not a single cat is labeled as, uh, as a cat, and not a single dog is labeled as dog. OK? That's the training set. Still, for some magical reason, I expect it to, when I show it, you know, the images from the test set, I expect it to know that, you know, that how a dog and how a cat looks like. I actually want it to, like, if there's a picture of a cat, it should say, say cat. If there's a picture of a dog, it should be a dog. So what do, we think, what do you think will happen when I do this experiment? Sorry? It'll be like you trained without the motivation. Yes, otherwise it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be surprising. So what we kind of might be, like the first intuition would be to expect that you will completely get 0%. Essentially, you will name every cat a dog and every dog a cat. But if you actually do it, you will end up having a non-trivial accuracy on this original task. So if you do it on the like cats versus dog CIFAR uh, question, you will get 78% accuracy. Again, even though I've never shown you seemingly a dog labeled as a, as a dog, a cat labeled as a cat. OK. What's going on? OK. So kind of the hypothesis or kind of statement that we have here is that maybe, so maybe the problem with like our mindset, like what makes this kind of experiment confusing is that maybe there was like the, the one assumption that we were making was that the cell perturbations are meaningless. But what if they are not meaningless? So what do I mean by that? So think about the following conceptual picture in which kind of we have two kind of predictive features in our data. There are the ones that I would call robust. So these are the, the features that kind of patterns that cannot be altered by applying the small perturbations to your data. So in particular, all the things that we as humans would use to distinguish between cats and dogs kind of would belong to this. But then there is also another set of patterns in data like that corresponds to features that we call non-robust. So these are patterns that can actually be flipped by applying only uh, small perturbations to the data. But you know, this, these features are also by themselves, like if they're not perturbed, they're also predictive of the correct label. Okay? And essentially, uh, when you are this, you know, deep like this machine learning model, and you try to just maximize the accuracy, both kinds of features are totally fine to you, right? Like essentially anything that allows you to predict well the label is just like, you know, is a valid feature to you. And actually, it turns out that these non-robust features tend to be often very good predictors of, you know, of, of the correct label. I'm not saying that individual features. I'm saying that as a collection of, like, you know, of the features, like in total, they seem to have very, uh, very good predictive power of what the correct label is. So now, if, you know, if, the, if they are good to get the correct label and we just ask our models to just get us you know, good predictiveness of the label, well, our models tend to uh, kind of tend to rely on these features quite a bit. But if we, our predictions are models that rely on this, you know, on these features quite a bit, well, when we start perturbing them, if we are able to just flip them in the inputs that we present to a model, you know, the model will think that this is a different class. And essentially, that's the kind of the, you know, that's the statement that we are trying to make here. Okay. So in particular, looking back to our simple experiments, kind of what, you know, what what, what happened was just the following: that we kind of started from this training set in which both the robust and non-robust features kind of were associated with the correct number, uh, like label dog. But then when we created the second training experiment, the robust features still kind of were consistent with like, what we humans see as dog or cat. But the non-robust features, by using adversarial perturbations, they actually flipped the kind of non-robust features corresponding to cat and dog to the opposite class. So when we did the relabeling, what will happen is that the robust features were now became misleading because they were kind of indicating the, the other class. But the non-robust features were sufficient to get good generalization because they were still exactly like, you know, correlated with the right sign with the dog versus, versus cat question. Okay? So essentially, like, and the crucial thing is that this adversarial perturbation had to flip this actually predictive feature in the data. So yeah, so essentially that's how, you know, uh, that's how we get the, the good uh, test accuracy because just kind of the, since the model like depends a lot on the non-robust features, since this signal is correct, it is still able to get the test set uh, like labeled correctly most of the time. Okay? So this is the, so this is the kind of statement. And this actually statement has quite a number of implications. Okay, so first of all, I think one important implication is, again, something that we intuitively know, but maybe that's now it's more stark contrast, is that kind of, again, when we approach our 
vision task especially, we have certain priors. We have certain view how models learn. And this might have nothing to do with how models actually learn. And that's actually a very important thing to, to, to keep in mind. Yes? Just to test this, uh, this issue, I, I, know, I think you already did it, but you can also do adversarial training on this perturbed data set, and then it should be to confirm your hypothesis that it's not like everything is going to be flipped. It's going to detect dog okay. and cat. And I'm not sure what exactly, but like we did many of these, and again, I want Jerry to not have to kick me out. Sure. So uh, after, that, but like we we did many things to try to like first, you know, spoil this, like you know, kind of disprove it, and we couldn't. Okay, so yeah, and the point is that these are the equally valid classification methods, and you should know there should be no expectation unless you do anything else to kind of to that you know the model uses one way or the other way to solve the task. It just wants to solve the task as stated in your objective function. So for instance, you know, as I said, examples are in a sense a human phenomenon. It's not just something wrong with the machine learning model, it's just the kind of we are asking for something and we don't understand exactly what we are asking. It's more of a misspecification of the task than actual glitch in the machine learning model. And essentially, if you want to have in particular interpretable models, you really have to think about this at the training time. Because if your model is actually making prediction on, based on stuff that you don't understand, like you can't comprehend, you never will make, be able to make it interpret interpretable. You first actually have to force it to think like a human before you can actually produce an, an, you know, an interpretation that human will understand. Okay, and essentially, you know, and essentially, you know, you exactly you can kind of view, can view can view robustness as kind of a way of trying to put additional restriction or the prior on like how your models work to kind of to make them more interpretable. Okay, so this is kind of the message now. What happens now? Well, as I said, I promise you some answer, or at least like partial answer to questions. Okay, so this is actually gives you a, a new perspective on artificial robustness, and also other questions too. So, for instance, like okay, so one cool capability that comes out comes out out of this, you know, out of this uh, kind of understanding is that now we can do something like a robustification of a training set. So we can take can take an original training set, and create from it essentially a robustified data set. And what is fun about this data set is that like, when I'm on this data set, I can actually train in whatever way I want. Like I can just use classic training, and I'm still getting both standard and robust accuracy. So again, this is not exactly what happens, but the idea here is that you might be able to suppress or filter out all of the non-robust patterns in the data, and then the only way to classify this model uh, you know, kind of correctly is to use robust features. And if you are only doing classification in, uh, using robust features, then you are robust by definition. How do you get the robust uh, essentially, what you do is okay. Uh, I, I will tell you after, like at the party. But like the point is that you are using a robust <laughs> model to essentially ask it to synthesize a yeah. version of the original input that kind of you know only has the feature that make it believe that this is a, like a frog or something else. And that's the image that you get. While, I, while I'm enjoying kicking you out, you have like five minutes, so you don't have to be too rushed. Right? Oh, you don't know how much more I have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Um, uh, okay. So this is the new. Uh, so this is new capability. Can you, you can kind of manipulate these features and kind of filter out, mm. uh, 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 filter out these features. Uh, and in particular, this is kind of this. This data set is a counterexample to the statement that oh, we have adversarial examples like just you know, uh, essentially like we have vulnerability to adversarial examples uh, just because we are using batch norm, SGD, or resins or whatever. Essentially, you can train on this model in uh, whatever uh, whatever way you want. And you will still get robust classifier. So essentially, like so again, this of course factors can have an impact, but they alone will not be responsible for robustness. You can like here, there is no way to get non-robust like vulnerable models out of this, because essentially these non-robust features are are gone. So it's not about just how we train. Okay. So there are other other consequences that are kind of quite quite fine, fun. So in particular, the transferability now kind of makes sense, because features are a property of data set, not a model. So essentially, like any model trained on them will turn, uh, well, will, 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 is likely to use the same non-robust features for prediction, and that's why, you know, changing these features will actually lead to misclassification. Also, like why, uh, uh, like the robust training is is is, is effective. I, I know I did not explain what robust training is, but the point is that if you think, if you know what it is, or if you learn what it is, you realize that essentially what is kind of the way to view it is that what it's trying to do is trying to actually make all the non-robust patterns in the data be useless for prediction. Essentially, you always kind of pound your model. The moment it kind of tries to make a prediction based on some non-robust patterns, you kind of realize that, and you kind of like flip it to kind of to penalize your model for using anything that is not robust. Similarly for randomized smoothing, which is a way of adding like 
appropriately modulated noise to your inputs. To get robustness, you can view it as just kind of trying to overwhelm all by noise all the features that kind of are non-robust to the perturbation class that you want to be robust to. Okay? Again, I can go more, more into this. But kind of the point I particularly like is just this connection about, between the robustness and data efficiency. So this is something that we already talked about, that kind of learning robust, like robust machine learning seems to behave differently than the standard machine learning. And now it all makes sense. Since robust models can only leverage robust features, they are somehow uh, handicapped because of that, right? So you know, even though non-robust features do help with standardization, we don't allow the model to use them. So as a result, you will need to get more data to get a given accuracy. And you will also, in general, maybe you know, without using non-robust uh, non -robust features, you will never get the kind of top accuracy that would be possible if you just have to use only robust features alone. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the explanation of some of the facts that we observe in practice and in, in kind of we could show uh, in toy models. But kind of the question that I actually like to ask is kind of, is the fact th that like standard models leverage the non-robust features, is it actually even a good thing? Like again, of course, it's not a good thing if we care about robustness. But even if you don't care about robustness, like what using non-robust features actually mean? Okay, and you know this is a, so essentially like sorry, I I'm clicking too much. Uh, so kind of the sorry, what's happening here? Sorry. Yeah, I think I am. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> clearly, clearly using uh, uh, like clicker is is above my power, like above my pay grade. Uh, so kind of the thing is that maybe kind of, yeah, we can get the superhuman performance, but we only are getting it because we are using some patterns in the data that is not what is a part of the task that we actually want to solve, okay? And, you know, there is some nice theoretical model as well that you can kind of play with to see some of these effects. So for instance, you can see that if you think about most, uh, like maximum likelihood Gaussian classification, essentially like, you know, if you go from what is the right decision boundary for standard task, and you, starting, you start adding some robustness aspects, you realize that the actual answer will kind of shift. Like what you, like your estimators of like, kind of like how to classify in a robust way will actually be very different to how the kind of standard, you know, standard uh, classifier would look like. Again, there are some theorems in the paper, but like the things to observe are the one of them is that somehow, we, here we have two directions. We have kind of the robust direction in which kind of, you know, large changes I know kind of large changes in the L2 norm do not lead much to the kind of changes in classification. And then at the non-robust direction, in which kind of small changes in the L2 norm might actually you know, lead to big changes in the classification. And clearly, if you want to have maximum the like, best accuracy, you need to use both, like you need to attune to this kind of different geometry in different direction. But when you want to have robustness, you actually have to forego this statement. And similarly, what is also cool is that kind of if you think about the gradient direction, essentially you ask yourself, I am some data point, and I want you to to get you the closest to the kind of to the data point that you know that um, to the data point that is kind of from a different class, kind of if you do this standard models, you will kind of go somewhere off the I would say manifold, even though this is like really like using too, too strong of a word. But as you are getting more robust, actually this direction kind of it, it becomes more like you go from the center of one cluster to the center of the other cluster. Okay. So this is kind of what we understand about these robust numerous features. Now the cool part, which I will do in the last, uh, you know, whatever time I have left, is to show, okay, so if we kind of have this inclination that maybe non-robust features is not something you would like to depend anyway, even if you don't care about robustness. So what happens if you look at the models that are robust from the point of view of like deep learning and different applications? So one thing you will realize is that actually the models, just by being robust, they become more human aligned. Okay, so one quick way to do this is just to look at kind of silency maps of your inputs. So if you do a, like essentially like what you do is you just have this heat map for every pixel. It just says how influential this pixel is in, in the making this, 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 this picture be classified as dog. If you do it to standard model, you get things like that, which are kind of eh. Uh. However, if you do it to robust models, you are getting things like this for free. Okay, so essentially robust, robustness acts as a prior that kind of enforces like using meaningful features. And then you know, what happens is also if you go look at the representations, then actually suddenly they start to make like behave like this geometric embedding starts to behave the way you would like it to be. So essentially, like it's we could not find two inputs that have similar representation but are very different in semantic way. Like it seems that now you are kind of fixing this, you know, these problems with that. And when you do that, well, a lot of cool stuff 
is happening. So I'm sure many of you have seen GANs and all these cool interpolations that you can do with them. Well, you know, uh, we can do the same things. Actually, we can do more in some ways, and you can do it in a way, way, way simpler way than how GANs go about it. Essentially, everything that we do is just, we just take robust representation and we apply some, the, you know, completely, uh, the most obvious, uh, you know, most obvious ways optimization. There is no regularization, no post-processing, no priors, and you are fully faithful to the model. So we can do things like interpolation of the input. So essentially, you know, we just have seen some interpolation, semantic interpolation of the input before. But now you can just, like, the thing that they don't tell you is that they actually have to find these trajectories in the GAN. They just, like, it's really like they have to be extracted from the, from the, from the GAN. Here I just take any two inputs, and I can just get interpolation right away in a very easy way. Okay, the other thing is that kind of like direct feature visualization, essentially like you can view of, for, every, for every neuron, uh, you can view kind of, you can, you can identify that they correspond to something important, you can do like cool stuff like adding stripes to the, you know, like once you know what the, is the, 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 stripe neuro, uh, <laughs> the stripe neuron, you can add it. And you can also do stuff like if you remember the, misla the mislabeled input over here, we didn't know why the model claims this is a dog if this was an insect. What you can do, you can enhance the features that, that, that kind of inform the prediction over here. And when you enhance them, you realize that actually this part looks like a dog, like a dog picture. Okay? So essentially, and you know that, uh, you know, like ImageNet models, they like to see dogs because there's many dogs in the data set. And that's what they are actually hallucinating over here. Okay? And <laughs> the other thing, but this is beautiful picture. Everyone wants to see the beautiful picture. Come on. Uh, so uh, you can get a very simple, like, generative models, like, really out of the box in a very simple way. Like, this is something that before, like, two years ago would be state-of-the-art, like, gun-based stuff. And you can get it just, like, for free and very easily. You can also get, you know, like, other cool gun applications right away. You can even do things like manipulating kind of, you know, your data set semantically. You can make a picture of a dog be more like a cat and so on and so on. You can even do things like you can just take an image and if you know the face up, you can do, you know, you can play with this kind of stuff. You can kind of change the properties of, this e of the image in the semantic way. Again, everything is very simple. You can actually play with this demo yourself. It's over there. And that's essentially all I have to say. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I, will not, I, I will not get you through that. Uh, uh, I guess the point is that, you know, since like I, I really respect Jerry, uh, I, I just want to say that like kind of, you know, we, we started to care about robustness because of the like safety questions. But now what we understand is that these questions are actually more about trying to like, essentially you should think about adversarial robustness as just a way of imposing prior in our models. Some of them are, might be just because of safety reason. Some of them might be actually that this is the way to regularize our models, to kind of depend on the features that we actually want them to depend, as opposed to the, the features that seem to be kind of the right one for the model, which doesn't have any preference by itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, All right, so for our final talk of the day, we have Soledad Villar from NYU. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I want to talk about graph neural networks, which is a family of neural networks that are used to learn algorithms for combinatorial optimization problems and combinatorial problems. Uh, if this is in a similar idea to Nina's talk earlier today, how to learn algorithms from a family of parameterized algorithms. Uh, I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, what this class of graph neural networks is. And in order to do that, I'm going to motivate it by uh, the example of clustering the stochastic block model uh, um, as a motivation of how you define this, this class of algorithms. And in particular, I'm going to motivate this by some results by Andrea and Emmanuel. Uh, just I'm going to give you like a rough introduction that it may not be 100% accurate. But the idea is the following. Um, the idea you, you have a graph sample from the stochastic block model where uh, basically you have a graph where there's two planted communities and you draw an edge between two nodes in the same community uh, with probability p and across communities with probability q with p is greater than q let's say and then you observe an instance of this of this graph and you want to identify what the communities are so if you look at the adjacency of this matrix it looks this form, but then if you reorder the, the nodes so that the 
actually belong to the first nodes belong to the first community and the second nodes belong to the second community, you obtain something like this that reveals the community structure in a way. So actually, if you look at the expected value of this matrix and you look at the second eigenvector, then, the, the, then that reveals the community structure. And this is like in the expected values, it's just a rank two matrix. However, uh, and this spectral method works really well in dense case, but when you are in the sparse regime, this doesn't work anymore. In particular, uh, the spectrum doesn't concentrate very well when the graphs are sparse, and the Laplacian is not useful for clustering. But there are other methods that succeed, such as the semi-definite program. Um, however, it's not everything, not everything is lost for spectrum methods. There are some specific spectrum methods that you can look at that come from the uh, statistical physics community that they observe that actually this uh, spectrum methods coming from non backtracking operator from belief propagation, actually you look at the, at the eigen, eigen spectrum of these matrices and they reveal the community structure. So, and they also observe that uh, these, these, uh, these spectrum methods are in correspondence with uh, this Beth Hessian that, that is a kind of like a regularized spectral, uh, like regularized Laplacian, where you, depending on some parameter that depends on what is the model for the stochastic block model, that P and Q and N, uh, you can construct this specific Laplacian. And if you look at the eigenspectrum of this Laplacian, then it actually uh, reveals the community structure all the way up to the informatic theoretic threshold. However, this uh, this is very unstable. If you look at the uh, at the uh, unstable with respect to model misspecification. So, for instance, if you say like this, this is a plot actually from um, Andreas' paper where they show that there exists uh, this uh, specific perturbation where you select a few no a few nodes in your graph and you produce very small clicks. And then if you if you do that, then the spectral method doesn't work anymore but the, the semi-definite program is still robust with respect to this perturbation in the model. So basically what we want to do with these graph neural networks is for specific combinatorial optimization problems, we want to generate robust spectral methods for these problems to, and see if we can learn this and, and see how they perform. So uh, one, one way to to think about this is as you can think of uh, spectral methods just like a, an instance of a spectral method. You can write it as a power method, a power iteration. And just you choose some initialization and then uh, you apply your matrix many times. And you can enroll that as a neural network by just uh, applying, uh, thinking of uh, each layer of your neural network to be one instance of your power method. And, and then, uh, you want to learn how to combine the operators of your graph in a, very, in a good spectral method. So you, you can just say, well, I'm just, for each of my matrices, I'm gonna choose a parameter theta that depends on like, these operators on the graph. And then this is just a, like, a power iteration. Uh, but then you, we, like, it was established yesterday that overparameterization is good for, for this kind of optimization problems in generalization and in optimization. So one can um, overparameterize the setting and uh, uh, so this, this theta is just not a scalar, but you can make it to be as a matrix and you can learn an embedding of your previous, the, an embedding of the output of your previous layer for the next layer. And uh, so the, this, and you can make these uh, these parameters depend on what layer you are. So it's not a, a power iteration anymore if you don't share the weights. And and then uh, these are the trainable parameters of your model. And this is what is called well spectral GNN. And also you can apply uh, nonlinearity at each of the layers. So this is uh, this is the way the spectral GNNs are defined. And this is one of the ways of thinking how to motivate this, this, these classes of functions that we want to analyze. And Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the yeah. uh, notation. What is B? What, where does it live? So M is an N by N matrix. B is a vector that lives in uh, N times DT, where T is the, is the layer. 
So it's, you can think of it. If you think of it as uh, the, all this dt equals 1, then it's just the multiplication of a matrix times a vector, and this is a number. But then you can make this uh, just a small matrix, and then you can make this times dt times dt plus 1. Does that make sense? So in particular, this architecture does not depend on the size of your, of your graph. So you can train it for graphs of size 100 and then test it in size of size. Because basically, you're learning how to combine the operators of your graph in an overparameterized way. Yeah. Rho operates on the rows of. This is entry-wise. No, 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 no. But this is entry-wise on this matrix. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's mm -hmm. Um, also, they extend this, this definition to consider also the line graph, uh, and, well, like this uh, number operators, number tracking operators that are in the indexed by the edges of the graph, and other, other graphs like the power graph, etc. And the interesting property that this architecture has is that if you apply a permutation to your, to your graph in the labels of the graph, then that permutation comes, comes out. It comes outside. And that's what you care about because the labels on your graph are not an intrinsic property. You care to learn something that does not depend on the way I'm giving you the graph. And that's that's an important property for this. And so in this paper by Zendao Chen and Lisha Lee and Joan Bruna, they apply this idea to the stochastic block model and in particular for the for some specific cases, like in two communities, and I think in other, other cases, they show that uh, empirically they can make it all the way to the informative directory threshold using this line graph neural network. And they have some uh, theoretical results where they use some simplifications on the model, and they can show that all the local minima have some bounded loss with respect to their model. But I think that there's a lot that can be improved in, this, in that setting. And also, uh, Weichi extended this setting to, so here this is trained with the, with the labels of the model that you generated. Uh, so in particular, this supervised learning, you train it with the known community structure for random instances of your model. But Weichi extended this idea to unsupervised setting, uh, so she considers a max cut on random regular graphs, and she modifies this idea to like a, a version of uh, um, reinforcement learning, and she shows that it can perform quite well. Um, another motivating example for these specific graph neural networks is um, the quadratic assignment problem, where basically one wants to learn how to match these two graphs. So in particular, uh, you can write the quadratic assignment problem as a disoptimization. And uh, this quadratic assignment has uh, graph matching as a particular instance, and also deciding whether two graphs are isomorphic is deciding whether this objective is equal to 0. Also, you can write uh, the traveling salesman problem as the matching between a, a matrix with the pairwise distance and a, and a cycle between the, the uh, and a graph that is a cycle with this number of points, and distances between metric spaces. And you can also think of uh, how you can apply this graph neural network setting for this quadratic assignment problem. And basically, if you have two graphs, you can learn uh, an embedding for these graphs. And then you learn an embedding for the first graph and to, for the second graph. And then you, you con con compute the outer product between these two embeddings, and you round that to a permutation, and you see, and you do like back propagation with respect to that. And for specific models like random regular graphs and Erdos training graphs with some uh, planted noise, uh, we can uh, you can see how it performs. In actually, these graph neural networks can give you something that is comparable with the semi-definite program, or even better in some models. And you can also see how it performs uh, for for tra traveling salesman problem. Okay, this is just like a motivated example. But these spectral GNNs are not the only formulation for graph neural networks that exist. 
There are other formulations for graph neural networks, and actually there's a very large literature on graph neural networks very recently. Another way of looking at, at graph neural networks is as message-passing neural networks. The idea is that every node uh, has some information, and then it communicates with their neighbors, sending their information, and aggregates whatever they received, and, send, and update their, their knowledge. Um, this um, these message passing neural networks are also satisfied, satisfy this essential property that if you apply a permutation on the labels, you obtain the same permutation in the output. So, the, or, or in particular, if you, if you write it yeah, that way. And, and then a natural question about um, what can you do with these graph neural networks uh, was partially answered in, in this paper by uh, Yura Leskovic uh, Le and Stephanie Chikelga in ICLR 2019, where they ask how powerful are graph neural networks. And, and they ask how powerful are graph neural networks by asking the question of how good are they distinguishing non-exomorphic graphs. So basically, given your class of graph neural networks, in particular, they studied these message passing neural networks, uh, uh, is there, like, if you consider every function in your class, how, how well can they perform by solving this graph isomorphism problem? And what they show is actually that these message passing neural networks are, can be as powerful as the Weisfeld Lehman test from 1968, which is a test based on message passing. And this test is also equivalent to a linear pyramid relaxation of the quadratic assignment problem. And in particular, if your initialization is uh, the, the, the null features of your graph, then and these null features are uh, considered, let's say, um, do not have more information than whatever you see in the graph, then these uh, message passing neural networks cannot distinguish between non isomorphic regular graph with the same degree. So they are not very powerful in that setting. Um, however, there is uh, another idea of looking at these uh, graph neural networks. And um, this is some work by Jaron Lipman and his group, and also Gabriel Peyre and Nicolas Keriven, where they consider uh, a different class of graph neural networks that are not the message passing neural networks nor the spectral neural networks that we discussed just now. And basically what they say is, if one wants to consider all the linear functions from say k tensors to r uh, that are invariant with respect to permutations, then actually when these linear functions are very easily parameterized. And the dimension of this space is, uh, is well, is, is very simple. Like if you consider just the matrices, uh, all, all the invariant functions from matrices to R, then the dimension of that space is two. Because given two of diagonal elements, there exists a permutation that sends one element to the next. And given two diagonal elements, there exists one permutation that sends one to the other one. And in particular, if you have K tensors, then the dimension of that space is the Bell number of K. Which is, which is actually the number of ways to split uh, an element of uh, k elements in subsets that correspond to how do you match uh, what, what kind of diagonal or of diagonal elements in that setting you match to whatever else. Hmm. And so if you, in particular, this, the dimension of this space is not, does not depend on n if n is large enough. Right. So the, these invariant functions are very easily characterized. And if you look at equivariant functions, then you can just do an algebraic trick and realize that it's actually the same as looking at the invariant functions with double the tensor. And, uh, and they show that if you construct an, an invariant network that is con constructed by composition of linear invariant networks, with some activation functions that can be real or sigmoid that 
um, then this, this family of neural networks universally approximate the space of invariant functions. And actually, in the, in the, in the paper with Gabriel, uh, of Gabriel Peire, then show that the same thing happens for equivariant functions. And, um, and the idea is that they just approximate uh, invariant functions by polynomials and using some bias and then they, they see that um, uh, they can write uh, polynomials with tensors, basically, as linear functions in tensors. And, but in order to universally approximate, then you need to go to a, a very high order tensors. And the rates of convergence are not known. Uh, so, uh, so in particular, how do you put all these like graph neural networks, families, and ideas together? So uh, what we did was just we just look at the the graph, the graph isomorphism question that um, this how powerful our graph neural networks paper looks at, and the universal approximation question are actually the same thing, which is 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 very simple to see. Like you can think that. Uh, um, you can say that a class of function is a graph isomorphism discriminating if given two non-isomorphic graphs, there exists a function in your class that separates them, that gives you a number in one and, and, and a different number in the other one. And of course, the class of functions that we care about are invariant. And then um, you can see that if you can universally approximate, of course you can solve graph isomorphism. And if you, if you have a family of functions that uh, is uh, graph isomorphism discriminating, then you can construct a two-layer object, neural network, that can actually universally approximate. So looking at this problem is equivalent to looking at the other problem. And you can use this uh, language to, to, cla to classify uh, the different classes of neural networks and different classes of uh, functions expressed in this way in terms of how well they perform at solving the graph isomorphism. So in particular, you can construct examples of, uh, um, of graphs that cannot be distingu distinguished by the LP, but can be distinguished by uh, these G, uh, G invariant networks, uh, these uh, two-layer invariant net networks uh, that um, Lipman considers. And also, you can construct examples that, for example, you can look at, at other classes of functions that are not neural networks, like semi-definite programs or spectrum methods, and see how well they, they perform at that. And in particular, you can use, for instance, this, this linear uh, invariant networks and add operations, like you can multiply the output of two layers and obtain uh, functions that are more expressive than the, the previous one, et cetera. And so this is uh, more or less all that I wanted to say, but um, some interesting questions regarding to this problem are, uh, so how to connect the depth of the architecture or the architecture of your neural networks with a class of graphs that they can separate. Also, this, this analysis of this op optimization landscape that tells you that the local minima are uh, good in some way, and how can you uh, ex write it in the, in the case of these um, specific GNNs? And something that I'm interested in and I'm currently working on is the connection of these, uh, these invariant functions with the sum of squares ideas. The idea is that the, there's this sum of squares paper uh, where they show that for the problem of, of detecting hidden structures, uh, the existence of a like sum, uh, sum of squares proof that one planted that one graph comes from one, one planted model or the other one uh, can be written as some spectral method and and these spectral methods are typically non explicit and they mm, it's not obvious how it's not it's obvious how you can write this as a graph neural network, but in particular, I believe that these spectral methods should have this invariance property, and can we learn them, can we express them this way, etc. So, this is it. Thank you.
I actually had a question uh, about this witness connection to SOS. So are you in the regime where the the spectral methods do work, and you just want to say whether or not like uh, you can express them in its framework, or is it like in, in another setting? So uh, there's a specific class of problems where they show that the existence of a sum of squares uh, is equivalent to the existence of a spectral method. But it's not a, a classical spectral method. It's like, a specific uh, some spectral method of a specific form where all the they construct a matrix where all the entries are polynomial. They show the existence the of such matrix, right? Mm -hmm. They show like the existence. They, they show the existence of, of such a matrix, but the the it's not explicit and also it's not known that it's invariant. But the fact that if you look at if if you if you see that these polynomials are invariant, then the search space of your parameters would not depend on the size of the graph. In the same sense that invariant polynomials do not depend on that. This is not known, right? The, as, far as, I can, as far as I can tell, like the certificates could be very different uh, for different sizes of the comments. Yes. Okay, I see. Other questions? So you gave at the beginning this example of robustness, so are there are other examples that you have in mind where you know, this, for instance, this uh, power iteration that you described is so, application? Uh, I, I I don't know, but I uh, I was thinking in that specific specific example. But for instance, for the quadratic assignment problem, it's not obvious that a good spectral method exists for any of these of these models. For instance, if the if if the model is trivial, like you have a two graphs that basically they exist a permutation and the graphs are not the, like like they have different spectrum and things, then yes. But otherwise, there there may not be a spectral method in that. Specialized, I think, either. Do, do you know? Yeah, no, no. Okay. No. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again.